Hi, today we've got a hot air station to take a look at. This one is the Quick TR1300A. And this is designed to be a slightly higher end model compared to the 861DW that a lot of people have. And we've kind of lost the quite familiar form factor that we saw with a lot of the Quick stations. So we haven't got the uh, three buttons at the front for the presets and we haven't got the up and down buttons for temperature and flow rate. Those are all using the six buttons on the front here and this semi-graphic LCD display. So this is a 1300 watt heater in the handle. It's available in 110 and 220 volt versions and the flow rate on this one is between 6 and 70 litres per minute. So here it is on AliExpress and as you can see it's a little bit more expensive than the 861DW. It's £380 delivered and in this bundle you get the main unit itself you get the handle as well as a cradle and then you get a few different nozzles, a 4, 6 and 8mm nozzle that plug into the end of the handpiece. So looking at the website, they've highlighted some of the functions and features of the unit. So they've got a ceramic heating element in the unit, which is what you'd expect. Um, it's got constant airflow, so even if we switch from one of the wide nozzles to a small one, we're supposed to get the same airflow out of the handpiece, so there must be some kind of feedback in the base unit for that to happen. So when we take it apart, we'll have a look and see if there is some kind of pressure sensor. Now it does mention we've got multiple communication interfaces, but on the unit that I've got on the bench here, there's no sign of those interfaces. So I don't know if that's a, an option, but I certainly couldn't find it. Um, and then they've highlighted some more of the features here. So 1300 watts, as I mentioned before. Now this is primarily just to get the handpiece up to temperature very rapidly. Even at the highest temperature and the highest air flow rate, it's very unlikely that we're gonna draw 1300 watts continuously. This is just about speed for heating up. They've got zoned heating. Uh, so this is where you can actually set up some uh, profiles where, for example, it would heat up the board to 150 degrees for three minutes and then automatically raise up to some higher temperature. Uh, then we've got a password lock to stop people changing settings, power off protection. So this is if you had a power cut and you happen to be using the hot air station and then the power went out and you just place the um, handpiece on the bench, when the power returns it will prevent the heater being turned back on. Uh, because one of the things that you might do is just leave it on the bench forgetting that you hadn't physically turned it off on the unit and then you could come back to a situation where you had uh, the power turned back on and it was blowing out hot air all over your desk and setting fire to stuff. Um, so it's got sleep function and it has a soft on off power switch. Um, that's actually quite high power consumption for sleep, 0 0.8 watts, but there is a physical power switch on the back of the unit if you don't want to rely on that soft on off. Um, and then constant flow, so this is what I was talking about, constant airflow unaffected by nozzle dimensions and nozzle tube deformation. So uh, unless um, they're just saying that based on the, the power of the vortex fan, then there must be some kind of feedback in the unit. And that's about it really. It says ESD detection, so it's supposed to be able to detect whether the earth is connected. Uh, so we'll see if it can detect that. Uh, obviously units Celsius or Fahrenheit and auto shutdown. So let's take a closer look at the unit itself. So here's the main unit, and I think it looks really quite smart, actually. It's definitely improvement over the previous designs. Uh, this one has an LCD on the front here, so we've got a seven-segment display, I think, for the temperature, and then there's various icons and that kind of thing. We've got the temperature up and down buttons, fan speed up and down buttons, channel, which I think is the three presets, so you probably press this to cycle through those, and the soft on-off button for power. Then at the bottom we've got the connector that goes off to the handpiece. So uh, this is open on the inside, connects to the tube, so the airflow comes through this. And then we've got this Molex Minifit Junior connector which has all the, the electrical connections to the handpiece as well. And then you just screw the whole thing in with those two uh, screws here. So that's the unit. It's mainly made of plastic but um, it's quite robust feeling. It doesn't feel very plasticky, it's actually quite a nice nicely built unit. Then at the back here, uh, which is the only other side that has anything, this is where it illustrated there might be some connectivity, but as you can see it's blanked off on this unit. We've got the mains connector, as well as a hard power switch and a fuse, and then just the rating plate. So no C mark, no UKCA mark, 
um, it just says lead free rework station input 220 volts 1300 watts 50 60 hertz 10 amps uh, made in china serial number and then just a thing to say it's an original chinese quick station uh, it looks like this chassis is used for other things as well because it looks like there's space for a fan there but that's obviously not fitted in this unit um, and then we've got a connector here for the ESD uh, to connect it to your mat or whatever else. So let's take a look at the handpiece and this is quite a big and chunky handpiece. Overall uh, from tip to the end of the cord grip is about 30 centimeters so really quite long. The center section is about 20 centimeters or so but if you compare it to uh, the Metcal from the HCT 900 you can see this one's quite a lot more compact. Um, so that is potentially something that you might um, want to consider, especially when you're using it near a microscope and that kind of thing. Uh, this extends quite a long way up and is quite unwieldy. And then it's attached to quite a short, thick hose. This is only about 75 centimeters long and it does restrict your movement quite a lot. So if you've got your unit on the bench um, towards the back or something like that, that does mean you start to feel the weight of this, of this um, tubing quite heavily. Again, compare it to the Metcal HCT 900 and this one's significantly thinner and a lot more flexible and a lot longer. So you don't have that kind of restriction. Uh, this one, you really do feel the hose pulling on the handpiece quite a lot while you're trying to use it. Uh, in terms of the nozzle on the end, it's a friction fit and you can use the um, stand to help pull the nozzle off. In the end here, um, you can see it's not completely open, it's got this kind of thing to help swirl the air around. I think we saw that on the Quick 861X um, and that's supposed to be a bit more disruptive in terms of its airflow. Uh, but these nozzles just push straight in, uh, friction fit and pretty much stay on there um, like that. Um, in terms of the feel of it, it is um, plastic. Um, there's no glass reinforcement or anything like that so it does feel a little bit on the cheap side but there's no seams or anything like that so it's very very smooth along its length uh, quite comfortable to hold but as I said you just feel the tug of this wanting to work against you all the time especially if you're moving it around quite rapidly it's going to get in the way on this end this is the bit that plugs into the base unit and you can see it's quite restrictive in terms of airflow so as we saw on the inside that whole sort of port is where the uh, blower injects the air into but it has the electrical connection right in the middle so we only have this small bit and this small bit here for air to be forced down the tube uh, it might have been nicer if they'd offset the connector and just had the airflow just blown into one side uh, this feels like it's not the best in terms of low resistance flow uh, but then we've got a little gasket seal and that screws into the front of the unit uh, it is designed to be removable but I think once you've attached it once you're not really going to remove it again the Cradle is a new design compared to any of the quick ones that I've seen before. It's completely made of metal and does feel really quite heavyweight. We've got some rubber feet on the bottom here and the tool for removing the nozzles is actually quite nice. So if I get the handpiece, you can see you slide it in here and that actually holds the nozzle between these two bits of metal and then you can just pull it out and it stops this going flying everywhere. That holds it quite neatly in there and basically you can leave it there if you want to um, ready for next time then you just push it back in and it's changed over so quite a nice feature there uh, this does have the magnets in as you would expect so there's a reed switch in the handpiece and that just goes in there and gets held uh, when you're not using it and obviously it detects it's in the cradle and starts ramping up the fan speed to cool off the motor before turning it off so we've got an interesting construction and that starts to imply that the assembly costs are a little bit higher for a device like this. I was slightly incorrect, so this whole section is actually made of metal, it's just the front part that's plastic. But then we've got this inner chassis that's holding all of the insides together so there's no screws or anything like that on the outside. So here it is outside of the chassis and the first thing you notice is the size of the blower. This is absolutely huge. It's a British DC motor at the bottom and then really quite a big fan. I think this is the biggest that we've seen in any of the quick stations. Uh, then we've got a PCB at the top which I've just loosened off. Uh, this is the power supply as well as the British DC motor controller. And then we've got the user interface PCB at the front there with the microcontroller and all that stuff on there. 
At the back, we've just got the mains connector, and this is where those communications interfaces would have been, but it's obviously not an option on this particular unit. On this side, we've got the connections from the mains connector, and there was a earth lug onto the chassis uh, at this start earthing point, and that goes off to various places in the unit. We've got a mains filter at the bottom here to get rid of a bit of noise uh, to stop it escaping down the mains lead. Uh, and that's about it really. So let's take a closer look at some of these PCBs. So here's that top PCB and it's quite similar to some of the other quick hot air stations. It's got the power supply section and then we've got the brushless DC motor controller built onto that board as well which is a similar topology to what we've seen on other units. So this transformer is the standby power transformer and this is always energized uh, so it actually goes straight from the mains connector up to the transformer and then back. Now, unfortunately, it's supposed to be fused, but it's just linked out here and then goes straight back to mains live. Um, so this one's always energized. That's what gives that 0 0.8 watts continuous uh, consumption. And then when it is commanded to be turned on and off, there's the relay here, which turns on the switch mode power supply. And we've got all the usual stuff here. It's actually based around one of those switch mode controllers that's all integrated with the switch. So one of these five pin devices straight on the heat sink, controlling quite a large transformer actually. So um, the heating element in this unit is mains powered. So really this is just powering the blower and the electronics. So that blower must be quite high power for the transformer to be this large. Uh, but you can see here we've got the brushless DC motor controller, six MOSFETs so that we've got control of the three sets of windings. Uh, we've got the connection off to the front panel PCB uh, and this is the connector that goes to the blower motor. Uh, and that's about it really. So we've got some low voltage DC supplies here. So the power comes out of the switch mode power supply, goes straight to the brushless DC motor controller but then we also have a little switch mode DC to DC here and a 78L05, uh, so, sorry, 78M05 regulator here. So presumably we're getting some intermediate voltage, maybe 12 volts, something like that, plus a 5 volt supply. The brushless DC motor runs from 24 volts, so that's presumably what this transformer is outputting. But I would have thought they could have quite easily add a couple of windings on here so we don't have to have another switching regulator here. Uh, but they've chosen not to do that for whatever reason. But everything looks okay on here. Certainly no problems with the construction and we've got isolation where we need it and everything. So this looks to be quite a decent design. It's just a shame that they've linked out the fuse here that goes to that transformer. So inside the unit we've got the massive blower and now we can understand why the switch mode power supply was so large. It's 24 volt DC motor, 2.85 amps, which is getting on for 70 watts just for the blower. Now it also needs a 5 volt DC supply, that's presumably for the Hall effect sensors for the commutation. Uh, and then we've got the output of the blower connected directly to that connector at the front. And as you can see there is no pressure sensor or anything like that. So either they are monitoring the current from the blower and compensating for the restriction on the output, or they're simply relying on the sheer size of this blower and its static uh, pressure to be able to overcome the resistance of the nozzles that they provide, which is probably what they're doing based on uh, what I'm seeing here. I didn't see any current measurement really on the main PCB, and there's not really enough conductors on here to do all of that kind of functionality. So slight nonsense possibly with their claim of constant airflow, uh, although like I said, they might have just sized this so that it overcomes the resistance of any nozzle. Then at the front here, um, we've just got the basic control PCB. There's really not a lot on here. There's a bit of analog electronics at the bottom here for the temperature sensing and it's just got an ARM processor that's doing all of the processing. Really not a lot on here at all. Uh, another regulator, a uh, buzzer, which might be annoying and that's it. So uh, really it's just taking in some inputs from the buttons at the front of the unit. It's driving an LCD directly. It's reading the analog input from the temperature sensor and it's sending a digital control signal to the motor controller on the main PCB. So it's not doing a great deal, hence why this PCB is really quite simple. There is a four millimeter connector for connecting to your ESD mat and that kind of thing that is directly tied to this start earthing point here. Everything looks pretty much in order. It's only really this conductor here 
is a little bit thin. That's the one that goes off to the handpiece and possibly why it doesn't have the CE mark. Potentially this is a little bit undersized. But that's it really. Everything looks quite nicely made. Um, so I think you know everything looks good from the hardware point of view. So let's see how it performs. The unit's currently in standby mode and it's drawing a little bit more than they estimated. I think they said about 0.8 watts but it's clearly drawing uh, well over 2 watts. We'll turn it on with the power button on the front. We hear a relay click and it powers up and says it's in sleep mode. So while it's sitting here uh, in sleep mode it's drawing about 4.8 watts or so and if we remove the handpiece from the stand it fires it up and this is at quite a low flow rate and you can see the temperature is climbing up to the preset value. Now the temperature is really easy to change you just hold the temperature up or down buttons and it does go through the temperature range pretty quickly. Uh, obviously there are some hot air stations where this is painfully slow but it's quite responsive and gets to where you need to quite rapidly. Then we've got the airflow so the fan the same thing on the right hand side And it's fairly quiet, a little quite loud on the um, the highest speed, but generally speaking, the blower is pretty quiet on this thing. Now there was a little bit of, um, it sounded like feedback going on there, because it went a little bit slower than it intended to, and then sped back up. Then we've got the preset, so you hold down the channel button, and it says channel one, briefly and then it goes to that preset, channel 2, channel 3. On the left hand seat side here you can see that icon there blinking, that's every time the heater is powered up. And we've got an equal sign on here which says it's basically at the correct temperature. If we change the temperature down it says it's reducing that temperature. And if we go above it's saying it's raising it. When we put it back in the stand, it ramps up the blower to cool down the heater. Now one thing I don't like about this unit is it's not obvious how you enter the menu. It could do with either a dedicated button or at least a legend on the front panel, but you have to press T- minus and F- minus together, hold it down for a couple of seconds and you enter the menu. And the first options here are the three presets, so we can go into there. Uh, so these buttons at the top correspond to the soft buttons here, so we press enter. And here we can set some of the information. So let's say we want to change the temperature here. Uh, we press enter. Now this is where this button layout is a little bit confusing because you end up changing the wrong thing. Uh, I want to change the temperature and I think we have to press this button to scroll through. But then Adjusting the temperature up is T minus, and adjusting it down is F minus. So a little bit uh, confusing, but we can change the temperature there. Let's say we want it for heat shrink tubing. We might have it at something like 150 degrees C. Not bothered about the timer in this case, and the airflow. Uh, we probably want something a little bit higher than that. So 30, and we'll store that, and then we can press back. And then we can go through the other presets here. Then it's got an alarm as well. So if the actual temperature differs from the preset by the amount that you set on here, then it will start beeping at you. So you can tell if something's going wrong. Uh, ketones, so that's just a beeper. I've turned that off, but every time you press a button, um, by default, it will beep at you. Um, we'll go through units, so degrees C or Fahrenheit. And then you can set a password if you want to so that the settings can't be changed without authorization. And that's it really. So let's have a look at how it performs and then we'll talk about my thoughts on the unit. So first of all, let's see if we can get an indication how long it takes to heat up. So I've got a thermocouple into the end of the handpiece and we'll take it out of the stand.
And again, as before, the calibration just very slightly out here, so it's reading slightly higher on the end of the handpiece. I think if we change the fan speed, that might possibly change the behaviour a little bit. And so yeah, with that higher flow rate, we're now seeing a slightly lower temperature on the thermocouple. Let's try removing one of these RAM chips. So let's put some flux on the board. And we'll start heating it up. So we've got quite a high temperature here, about 430 degrees C. So the Metcal is a lower power hot air station, but according to the readout at the top, it's actually delivering a very similar amount of power to the handpiece at the moment. So let's start heating up that part. So onto my thoughts about the Quick TR1300A. And I've used it quite extensively now. I've done it on quite a few PCBs and a few things that I'm building at the moment. And it does work very nicely. So in terms of its performance, it's very good. But I do not like the user interface on this thing. They've matched it to, uh, if you recall, I did a review of one of the Quick soldering irons uh, probably last year or so, which had a similar kind of user interface. They've matched it to that but they actually make things a lot more complicated than it needs to be. If you compare it to the 861DW or the 861X, which is the one that I use, we've got up, down, on the left and the right for temperature and airflow, and three preset buttons. If you want to store a preset, you just hold down the button and it stores whatever it's currently set to. Really straightforward to use. This one is okay until you have to start going into menus to try and store presets, which I think is a, a bit of an annoyance, really. They could have just had an extra row of buttons and got rid of that menu um, just for channel 1, channel 2, channel 3 and that would have been nice and easy. They could have pretty much kept with the same style uh, button layout as on the other units. The other thing is its cost. So this is pretty much double the price of the 861DW and doesn't really offer you anything in performance compared to the 861DW. So if you're thinking about getting a hot air station and you want it to be fairly cheap the 861DW is pretty much unbeaten in that uh, respect because it just works uh, quite inexpensive as long as you get a genuine one. Uh, I know there are some very cheap ones and they've got dubious build quality. The 861DW is still, you know, not up there with the Metcal station, but certainly it appears to be safe and not really, I have not heard any reports of anyone having any uh, safety issues with the 861DW. So that's just my thoughts on this unit. You may um, think otherwise. I mean, it does look nice. It would look nice on the bench, especially if you paired it with one of uh, the quick soldering irons. Uh, but for me, the price is just a bit of a killer, really. If it was only slightly more than the 861DW, it would be a, an attractive proposition, despite the slight usability concerns. But uh, for me, um, 
unless you've got money to burn, uh, I would give this one a miss and consider some of the alternatives. So I hope you found the video useful. If you've got any thoughts or comments, leave them in the comment section down below. And until next time, thanks for watching.